Um, we're live. All right. Okay. So, hey uh, guys, we're Mike, and my name is Carl, and this is the first episode of Springboard. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing good today, man. Uh, just happy that we got this working. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, this is the first time in my life that I'm using OBS, so um, hopefully it will come out as clean as possible. And um, anyway, <clears throat> let's uh, let's start. Um, as musicians, as artists, we we have always wanted to do something for. Uh, our current music scene, which is uh, the electronic music scene, and for a long, long time we we have um, uh, seen how the scene slowly is dying and how just uh, let's see um, um, hit and run artists come and take tiny bits like production techniques. Or even uh, trends out of electronic music, and they don't give too too much credit to where, where credits do. And so yeah, yeah. we decided to create this space at least uh, as a podcast, and then we we've been talking about a blog and maybe some other stuff that can come from here. So we can actually try and undo some of that damage. Uh, yeah. What's, yeah. What would your take be, Mike? What do you think? Can we can we achieve that goal? Yeah, I mean that, that's that's basically, you know, to, to boil it all down, me and Carl, we we're, we're in love with electronic music, the electronic music culture, the electronic music scene, the uh, economy, the technology, the reason why it even exists, and um, even though me and Carl are going to cover different music it's not just going to be electronic music that we cover but electronic music is what our focus is and i i think it's you know anybody who's a fan of you know and, and i'm talking to those of you who have been into electronic music for quite some time you know at least i want to say six plus years and you'll know what i mean yeah. that the music styles yes music styles change trends change but the um the the uh, culture is not as healthy because of the uh, uh, the assimilation with pop music. Pop music has uh, kind of been after electronic music for some time, and I feel like it's starting to get its way now. I mean, when you listen to pop music now, it's basically all very cheesy EDM. Uh, you know, um, and, and uh, I think that with Springboard what we're trying to do, we're not trying to rant and talk about how much we hate this band and this band or this artist, whatever. What we're trying to do is we're trying to bring back a, an awareness of where electronic music has come from. Pioneers, um, artists who aren't getting their credit. There's a lot of artists out here. You know, I'm going to drop one name, Lorne. Look it up. Um, if you don't know who Lorne is, you know, the man does not get his credit and he's very, people like him, not just him, but people like him. Uh, are is so important for the for the healthy or or at least for the health of electronic music and what me and Carl are trying to do is uh, make that uh, more accessible to everybody else you know there's there's not really uh, most of the electronic music news is stuck on the what everyone already knows side of the equation when it comes to electronic music and electronic music is is supposed to be a limitless medium. It's supposed to push every boundary possible because you're using computers, and computers are not limited <clears throat> to uh, human performance and physicality. So uh, by definition with electronic music, th it's supposed to always push the envelope. So when it starts becoming a safe bet, uh, then I begin to question whether the scene itself is healthy as it should be. Uh, it's supposed to be the fringe, you know. That that's what electronic music is. It is the fringe of music, you know. It's supposed to make uh, people who aren't used to something very uncomfortable, push them to the place where they uh, open their minds a bit more to different types of music, different types of uh, composition, different types of experiences. Yeah, definitely. It it 
electronic music to me has always been uh, this place where people come and play with sounds, not not necessarily traditional sounds, but sounds made with the most basic elements when it comes to uh, what uh, what what sound is, you know, like basic oscillation that can be recreated, yeah. for example, with an electronic oscillator or a or a synth or just uh, two two bricks. Let's see, let's see, all all those guys that always um, start doing uh, experimentation with pure data and Max MSP, which pretty much is all ambient music, but it's electronic music at its core. For example, right, to right. me, pure electronic music is that. Then we have uh, several branches of electronic music that have evolved over over the years and have crossed over with several other genres. For example, um, when our term music and disco music clashed, we finally got what is known now as house music. Right. And after a while it got popularized at, at gate clubs and, and the scene grew bigger and bigger and attracted other people that went just in the fringes. And at least what I feel that right now we have uh, in the current main mainstream is a variation of house and yeah yeah there was a point at least to me around 2008 2009 where house music and, ma and the mainstream uh, pop music kind of coexisted and they were at the best point when it when it came to feedback you know when uh, yeah Absolutely. When uh, uh, an electronic artist put out uh, put out a track, and a pop artist decided to collaborate on it, and the, the finish the finished result was actually that a, a clash of two worlds. But it wasn't that commercialized or that let's say packaged and then shipped, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And what we're seeing now is pretty much that electronic uh, music uh, is just a tool chest for the up and coming pop mu pop musicians or pop artists or pop producers to try and just take uh, tiny bits of uh, of production techniques that they can use to make the next hit hit single but just yeah. for pop not yeah. not necessarily for house music or electronic yeah. music in the end so yeah then we have yeah. this uh, this situation where there is no more feedback. There is not good pop music anymore, and uh, well, I believe that there there should be some artists that are actually go cool, actually good, but then the mainstream is totally it can it can be can be totally discarded because there there is no pop music that is actually special. On the other hand, we have uh, electronic music that has evolved, but uh, right now it's being used as a tool chest and. On the in the underground, we have uh, more uh, more artists that are interested in keeping that flow, that uh, that that feedback loop of electronic music going. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I may even actually add um, a good example of what Carl was talking about is if you look at what happened to rock music. Uh, if you go back and you look at what happened. Uh, the 70s was the most innovative time for rock music and guitar-driven bass music. That was when the most experimental things happened. That was where the most breakthroughs happened, the most sound design back then for rock music. That was when it happened. Um, and, you know, that was also when you had incredibly uh, experimental songs. Some, some were not so good, but quite a few of them were very good. From various bands you know um yes led zeppelin of course just to name two that were known for uh, ridiculously long opuses but uh had their own sound nobody did the same thing that they did back then and yeah. it was such a strong force that of course follow up is the 80s where pop had got its hands on rock music um and that was you know I don't think anybody would disagree with me who's a serious rock buff that rock has ever really recovered from that. We've kind of rock music has kind of, you know, said, okay, that sucks. Now, how can we just get back on a decent path? We're never going to get back to where we were, but can we at least recover from the damages? And to some degree rock did. Um, 
although I would say probably uh, the, this might sound a little uh, crazy to say, but I think what has actually helped rock and roll progress more than anything has been the extremes, the black metal scene, um, the, you know, even though it's oversaturated now, the gent scene, um, oh. you know, even though yeah. it's really oversaturated, those were the ones that pushed the fringe, you know, and it's not necessarily like it's good where, you know, back to where it was, but it's better than where it was. And yeah. um, I, I think that, uh, you know, and then of course the bands in between two bands like, you know, Tool and Deftones and, and Linkin Park, they, they, they have their, their time of, of pushing rock into a certain direction as well. But that's essentially what Carl is talking about is that we don't want electronic music to go down that route. And it sort of already is. It's not, nearly as far gone as rock is uh, in terms of that things can be restored to a decent amount but because of how quickly um, technology is progressing and because of how much easier it is to recreate these electronic elements in a song that has no business having that uh, in it basically what's happening is as Carl said these elements that make electronic music electronic are being borrowed and used over and over again. Kind of like, you know, you take the final countdown, the 80s song, yeah. really heavy, yeah. really heavy guitars, crazy guitar solo. It's a rock song, right? No, that was pop. Yeah. It, <laughs> that, that, that was it straight be, pop. It definitely reached the point where, um, where rock music, uh, just became a, a, a byproduct of everything. And, and that product got packaged, and you could actually form a band that was um, <clears throat> good-looking enough or not good-looking enough to actually sell that product. But at least uh, I think I, at, at that point, uh, rock music just lost a lot of um, a lot of, a lot of its of its core of of, of, uh, of uh, rock music's balls. You know, <laughs> it, yeah, it lost yeah, all absolutely. that attitude. Oh, <clears> at least from from the seventies, we from the seventies we had the the surgeons of well, we had like a classic rock, like arena kind of kind of rock, rock and roll, and then we had the fringe, which was the the up and coming metal scene, which uh, the the main artists at that time were the big four, the you know, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, and. Um, um, Probably Judas Priest. Yeah, and uh, which my call it? I'm forgetting one. Um, uh, well, I, right now I I, I can't uh, I can't remember, remember, but those are those are pretty much the ones that kind of like pushed on the boundaries of what rock and roll music could be, and then they sent some feedback over over the edge to. Yeah. To just classical rock, and then we have uh, uh, a little edgier kind of rock music. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, that's you know, that's kind of the same thing. That is, you, you could basically take that that very uh, that very uh, sort of like uh, equation and pass it on to electronic music, and you, you get virtually the same thing that's happening right now. You know, um, you go you go back far enough, and you have, you know, the old school greats. You have people like Kraftwerk. You have people like Tangerine Dream. You have artists like Gary Duman. You have uh, uh, people like, uh, you know, like, like like those three, for example, who yeah. were pioneers, huge pioneers at that time, and, you know. Electronic music had it, you know, had its. It, it we're, we're kind of in that age, you know. It took a little bit longer, but electronic music is kind of in its eighties right now, where uh, people are are basically using it for pop radio. And the issue with that is not not that you know. And, and just for anybody that has any questions about this, you know, what do we mean when we say pop? Because I'm definitely not talking about musical style. There's plenty of t electronic music, uh, even more retro electronic music from early 90s, mid 90s, 
that is pop. Yeah. But it's still electronic music. What we mean is pop culture. The problem with pop culture is that it destroys markets. Now, this is this is where the real concern comes from me and Carl. Every genre has its own economy. It yeah. has its own jo- it has its own jobs, it has its own scene, it has its own clothing line, it has its own its own industry entirely and there's jobs and there's places and there's there's something for everyone to fit into in that culture um every genre has one i don't care what genre it is every single one has one uh you know and so what happens is with pop culture is that pop culture because of the the ability of the influence how much money these companies have to oversaturate the market what happens is the the element of electronic music that is being used to push pop culture becomes oversaturated and pretty soon nobody cares about the actual culture anymore and the problem with that is once that happens you're talking about a bunch of people losing jobs losing livelihoods losing the ability to feed themselves from their art uh, you go back to the Beatles, okay? Right at the beginning of Rock and Roll's inception, uh, at least from the from the British perspective, because there was also something kind of rock and rollish happening here in America. But the British side of it with the Beatles, you go there; these guys were gigging like three gigs, two gigs a day. I dare a new upcoming rock band to actually find decent gigs at that amount it's it would be incredibly difficult to do um nobody you know rock music is not you know unless you're already established nobody really give you know uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, hate in rock right now a lot of hate in metal everybody just turns it into some kind of weird well my band's better there is no appreciation for the art form anymore it's kind of like fashion it's kind of yeah. just become this, this this fashion that you wear, this wristband, and oh, oh my gosh, you're a metalhead now. Um, and uh, that's kind of what has happened with electronic music slightly now, is now it's becoming this very generic, very sterile art form that you could actually say isn't really an art form now, especially with the rise of presets. And I, and I, and I have to say this one last thing too, and I'm going to let Carl... Uh, say a few things here the preset culture has got to calm down we have got to calm down and here's why you're basically it would be like what makes okay what makes hendrix so special it's hendrix yeah if hendrix could lend his hands his guitar his amp rig at at a certain point in time in a certain stadium with a certain string gauge, if he could take all of that and cram it into a little free download, and all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people who are really, really hungry for attention, they've all got this really great sounding. They did not have to know anything about the art form to make it. Yeah. This is when we start getting also from the other end of the perspective, the oversaturation of electronic music. We have too many people with rhythm presets. We have too many people with Skrillex presets. We have way too many people who are trying to sound like Diplo. Oh my God, please stop. Stop. Like, this is your part. This is this is a big gripe for me. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for the education. I, for one, do download presets and I do that to understand the process. I never use them in anything I create. I use it, I use it to understand how to use that synthesizer or how to achieve certain sounds or certain things of that nature but yeah, to was, use it i was go gonna i was gonna add on that uh, the the thing is so uh, when you download a preset pack at least let's say that you get like you know uh, uh Mumba sounds which uh, Mumba tone was popular at the time when diplo was starting out like with the whole express yourself uh track at the time and right. then when he made his project with Major Laser, and people, since this sounded different, people started buying the preset packs for Moomba sounds. 
Now, one thing is that you can do a remake of one of his tracks to understand what is he doing, which is pretty much like reverse engineering a fully produced track, which is exactly. totally valid. But at the same exactly. time, it's very easy for you to fall into the into the trap of uh, just I'm I'm just gonna switch uh, the notes and I'm gonna use the same sounds and since yes. Yes. this is the sound this kind of sound is popular I'm probably gonna get a few hundred likes or a few downloads of my track yes. or get yes. a little bit of attention now something else that can be uh, can can be uh, let's uh, let's see um, can be derived from all of this is that uh, in a context where where social media is so is a lot more prevalent than everyone is on social media, and everyone's looking for instant instant gratification in turn in in the form of likes or in the form of views and everything, then it's a lot easier for you to just fall into that trap of just I'm just gonna use this sound because it's popular and I'm gonna get a few a few hundred likes and I'm probably will have this sort of illusion, you know, that my career is starting as a musician. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Since, um, yeah. and, and that's, uh, that's true and false at the same time because you can't actually count uh, the amount of, uh, the amount of likes that, uh, the amount of likes that actually become purchases of your music or that actually become, uh, and say you 100 likes, uh, it becomes 10 people at your next gig. It doesn't necessarily work that way, you know. And yeah, since there is this whole you know uh, cloud in between these two analytics, uh, and these two anal uh, anal analytics data, then it's very easy for you to fall into that trap. Now, yeah, I agree with the part where the whole preset culture needs to calm down. Uh, but also, you know, presets should be just a stepping stone for you to find exactly. your personal sound. Exactly. Not necessarily, That's really my point, yeah. Yeah, not necessarily just uh, copying the sound of somebody somebody that actually made it as an artist. And exactly. Also, um, when it comes to the Beatles part, at that time, it actually the, the the whole argument connects because at at that time the Beatles they they only had so so many channels in order to make their music popular, exactly. so they gig like crazy two or three times a day, so they could actually promote their music out there, and uh, since we since they didn't have the internet, they didn't have um, uh, unrestricted access to the TV or the radio because at those times we had uh, really big corporations that uh, regulated the airwaves and also in terms of the radio you need to you need to you need to get acquainted with uh, with the DJ or you know you exactly. need to pay the DJ and the DJ usually charge a lot of money if you if he wanted to you know push your song to the number one you know so these kids just gig and gig and gig. Then, since the counterculture was a lot popular, was very popular at the time, it got through. But right now, yep, there's too many channels. Exactly, exactly. It's an over. It's an over. I think it's a a, a couple of pieces. Well, a couple of of different reasons why the oversaturation is such a bad idea. If you have an oversaturation of garbage, meaning you have too many people who are trying to do it, but they don't have the skill or the talent or the the patience or know with all. You know, what I mean, to actually do it. That's one thing, and and this and this is actually where I kind of get a little irritated with the with the preset culture. Is that you know, it's not just the synthesizers. You know, it's the mastering, it's the compressors. It's, you know, there, there's a lot of, and don't get me wrong, please don't get me wrong. Those are very helpful for, the, for those of us who know what we want to do and we make our own presets and we say, hey, let's pull that back up. Or there's a preset that comes with something that you bought and you're like, hey, this is exactly what I wanted to do in the first place. Shortcut leaves me a lot of time. But 
The issue, I think, is that because of that oversaturation and because of pop music simultaneously using that oversaturation to push its own you know, pop culture, what that does is a lot of electronic artists have got to change their sounds or push different sounds and do it soon enough that pop music um, basically is using something old and outdated. And 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 here's and here's the other the other the other issue too is that I'm all for the electronic artist making it. I'm all for them doing better for themselves. Even though there are there are irritations I have with certain ways certain things were handled, I'm very happy for Skrillex. I'm very happy for Diplo. I'm very happy for David Guetta. You know that's great. These guys made it to the very very top of the food chain. They probably don't have to worry about anything else for the rest of their life, and that's great. But don't give any more tools away for nothing, you know. And, and the problem with pop culture is once one secret gets out, it, it's 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 like a it's like a rumor chain. Everybody's gonna have that same exact thing, and you're you know before you know it, that one track you did with that one pop artist is gonna happen on every pop artist's track because it's popping. Everybody likes it, and pop culture is all about pushing for the money specifically for the money's sake so there is no conversation of hey you think we're kind of overdoing it hey you think the artist maybe should do something more honest that that's not really something that happens in pop culture now of course you could say to me well mike you're not there in the room talking about it. no but you can see the effects of it um somebody who cares about their car isn't going to drive a certain way while they're drunk and high at the same time they're going to, you know, take more precautions. The same thing goes for music and art. Um, someone who cares about the art is going to take certain precautions in what they produce so that things stay healthy. If you care for your body, you eat certain things. You don't smoke certain things or you don't drink, whatever. Well, however you want to see it. You know, I mean, there, there's so many parallels to that, you know. And so that's what's happening in pop culture. So you've got on one side pop culture and the other side the oversaturation of the market. And you've got, you know, all this stuff that has happened in, in electronic music that is so important. You know, Lorne, Eskimo, Aphex Twin, Square Pusher. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just naming a few, you know, um, mm. the, you know, th this is stuff that you may not like. You may think it's boring. You may think it's, it's not important. That's perfectly fine. You, you're entitled to your opinion, but every piece of that is needed to keep a healthy uh yeah it's an, a healthy it's an, culture a, it's an ecosystem it's an ecosystem in the end um exactly exactly I, I, so a couple of years ago when i was thinking about you know the whole mainstream underground thing and the thing is the at least when we have um when we have a scene like the electronic music when we have the mainstream electronic music and the underground electronic music and mainstream electronic music could be now the, the mixture between house music and pop and um, the more underground electronic music scenes like IDM you know yeah, yeah. so uh, in general what we have between the two is just um, you know when pop mu when the mainstream scene goes overboard and it's usually because they took something out from the underground and they oversaturated the market with it. Then, exactly when when it reaches its higher its highest peak, then um, it it all restarts. You know, it all restarts, and yep, the underground yep. needs. Uh, uh, at the time when this is happening, the underground keeps on evolving. But let's see if we have a new. A new listener that comes to electronic music. The new listener usually comes to the mainstream electronic music, and then, as uh, as much as he starts growing, he realizes that there is this whole new world which is underground music. Once uh, the mainstream electronic music sounds too boring to him, so he can actually go to the underground and find more music. You know, so in the end. What keeps the what keeps electronic music alive is this um, um, is this uh, uh, let's say coexistence 
between the two. Yeah. 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 So that, um, that, that's really the best way to put it. Yeah. So um, the the guy that started with pop and with electronic music that's more mainstream, he finds uh, different stuff on within the underground if he stays when you're within the underground and he also loves pop me in the, the most the, the mainstream the mainstream electronic music because it re, it reminds him of his starting a starting point in this whole world you know so right. in order to attract more people to underground underground needs the mainstream you know and the mainstream needs the underground to keep the mainstream going because the exactly. mainstream as as it is is not able to still come up with creative, with creative ideas, without exactly. an, without the underground making those ideas available, and that's exactly. something that that's something that we feel that uh, well that I feel personally that has been lost over the past years, you know. No, I uh, agree with you. At least, for I example, with within electronic music, uh, let's say within house music, we we have the oversaturation of progressive house music. Which is pretty much, you know, the guys like Swedish House Mafia, LSO, and uh, the Refune and Size Records uh, guys, the Swedes, you know, that they, yeah. that they prefer to make progressive house music, which is more uh, more melodic, is more emotional. But I feel that over the years and with the whole, you know, f uh, festival phenomenon, which we will talk about it probably in a, in next episode of Springboard. Um, <clears throat> You know that, that there is a, a an oversaturation to the point that, at least personally, I don't feel the emotion in those songs anymore, and it's very hard for me to find one song that's um, yeah. that's memorable. You know, but within yeah. within the underground, we have a lot more um, artists that uh, can uh, simply. Push the boundaries of their own art without uh, yeah. without without alienating their own fan bases. You know. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, um, I mean that that basically sums it up. That that really sums up the uh, the cause for concern when it comes to the electronic music scene. Now there is there is some good news here. You know that also needs to be discussed, and that is. That some uh, there are certain mediums that we're actually going to talk about in, in uh, today's episode that are very important to electronic music. Um, very briefly, we have some news about the Prodigy. If anyone knows who they are, they're very very important to electronic music. Uh, Crystal Method, another electronic music act, very important. But also the return of vinyl. Now. The idea of vinyl, I think uh, people primarily think of vinyl in a sense of uh, collecting, you know, oh, this is like an old heirloom from a time. But vinyl was also extremely yeah. important for its sound. And uh, the cool thing about vinyl is that, like most analog gear, uh, there's a a sort of an aging process that happens with it and a use like a like a like at like, like the more you use it some of the wear causes more characteristics and it has a story to it because every piece of vinyl that's made is made not exactly the same so it's there's like this uh this world of co continual possibilities that sort of you know changes what you do, what you created sonically in such a fashion that you don't you don't lose you know what you have but but uh you know it's one of those things it, it it's very very important for electronic music and so uh we're actually going to cover some of that and uh talk about some of that today as well so yeah so maybe we can maybe we can start with uh the news about uh the latest prodigy yes yeah i've uh, finally was able to listen to their uh, latest track um have you have you been able to listen to it 
I have not had a chance to listen to that one. Yeah, uh, well, the latest part of the tra track is actually more, is slower than uh, that what you would believe. You know, it's actually called Need Someone, which is the first single of the newest album. And uh, I believe that this song is gonna, is, uh, is probably, I'm not gonna say it's gonna save electronic music, but it's definitely a breath of fresh air, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's kind of it's kind of like when uh, when Daft Punk released the Random Access Memories uh, album uh, to oh, many yeah. to many electronic music fans, it, it it totally sucked. But it grows on you. I remember it at does. the time at the time I didn't I didn't understand it up until like maybe a couple of years ago where I decided to re-listen to a whole thing and what they actually wanted to do and, and it's actually pretty good. Now, if we, yeah. if we have Prodigy return, returning after a long time with, with new material, um, yeah. which, uh, which it doesn't mean that they have been inactive, they have been touring, you know, extensively they're exactly. one, of, one, one of the bands that tours a lot, one of the electronic music bands that tours a lot. With a with our with our current catalog, which includes you know the classics like like Breathe, yeah. Smack My Bitch Up, and those kinds of things, <laughs> you know, which are, which are the songs that most people know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. No, no easy easier, you know. So, I need someone. Uh, it's actually a song. That uh, resembles what would be, um, what what would be, electro house, at the at the two thousand and ten to two thousand eleven mark, but with the old school feel. Like it should have been, it, yeah. it should have been done. You know, yeah. And kind of like going back yeah. to that. Um, uh, old school dance, uh, you know, break dance uh, uh, feel of the uh, within the beat, you know. Yeah, uh, I would totally yeah. recommend you guys to listen to the latest track, and we we will be waiting for the for the album, definitely. Oh, absolutely! And just to add into that, do check out their last album, "The Day Is My Enemy." Yeah. Do check that out. That album is absolutely phenomenal um bands like uh, well specifically the prodigy they're a, a huge breath of fresh air because um big beat music which has for some reason i don't and i don't know if it's just me you correct me if i'm wrong carl but you yeah. most blogs electronic music blogs cannot wait to talk smack about big beat and i don't know why now i understand that you know there is this stereotype with big beat because it's been used in pretty much every action film um it's done for you know all kind of like driving sort of commercials in the past and things like that i can understand yeah. that but big beat itself i mean if you just take a minute listen to even just the chemical brothers the kind of things yeah. that they did with big beat you know and and you know the prodigy bat boy slim uh you know um to me, I feel like Big Beat is one of those sides of electronic music that doesn't have a modern, a modern voice, except for what the Prodigy is doing right now. As far as I'm aware, I'm not saying that there isn't something else out there, but as far as something with this much clout, this much attention, this high on the on the scale, I can't think of a single person or a single artist that is still using big beat but it's it's growing it's mutating it's evolving you know it doesn't sound you can tell this is a the prodigy track you, you can tell right away if you if you've ever listened to prodigy before as soon as you listen to this new track i was listening to it actually as you were talking um you hear it you know it's the prodigy instantly you know it right off the bat but yeah it doesn't sound like they're it doesn't sound like you know big beat music from back in the 90s it sounds yeah. like, hey, well, Big Beat's big, big, kind of getting bigger. It's kind of growing up. It's changing a little bit. And that's exciting because uh, 
to me, big beat was a very important thing in electronic music. And yeah. it would be a shame to see it go away. So please do check out yeah. that last album. Day is my enemy. It's a very good album. Definitely. You know, about big beat, 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 beat music, um, I, I, I honestly didn't know that there were many blogs that kind of like yeah, talk shit about, uh, about big beat, beat, you know. And uh, to me, when I was growing up, Watching, you know, just uh, straight up action me movies from the 90s, many had very, very good soundtracks. And it, it was the, yes. the influence of these guys that were, you know, they were the French. So at the time, the producers decided, you know, why do we need to go with a Frenchy? We need to go with a, with a, with a musical approach that isn't isn't the norm and kind of to stand out between all those uh, other films you know so they started taking this uh, you know these songs out, out of blue there, there are tons of bands there are hundreds of bands not only in electronic music but also rock that had you know uh, tracks featured in um, in these in these movies and um, there were, there were bands that maybe they only had one hit single or they had a few a full you know discography 10 albums but you know there there were healthy bands that got the break on these uh, got a, some some sort of break i wouldn't say their break necessarily but an, an opportunity in these films you know so yeah yeah um i think there can be a situation of over usage of those songs within within film at that time, so that's kind of why why people got tired of Big Beat. But the core of Big Beat was always creative. You know, for example, yeah. Fatboy Slim, all the tracks are made with a sampler. You know, yeah. he he plays only maybe the guitar on some of the tracks or the bass, which was his main, which is his main his main instrument and the rest is totally sampled for example another example of that is right now the prodigy the prodigy for for uh, tracks like voodoo people or uh, or smack my bitch up they sample the whole they sample everything even the drums and yep. they built and built and built a track with those pieces you know so that that's something something that has gotten lost also and i believe yeah. that right now yeah. they're going a little bit a little bit towards that with with, with I need someone, which is the, the latest uh, the latest their latest single, but uh, they are including modern elements also, you know, like modern right. production techniques and stuff like that. But the, the core prodigy is that is right there because they actually develop their sound, you know. But anyways, we can we can talk about the prodigy all day. <laughs> Here. So yeah, 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 really good. The next one is uh, Crystal Method. Crystal Method is releasing more music now. Now that we're talking about uh, the big beat, uh, the yes. whole big beat scene, there, they were yes, they weren't as instrumental as, for example, uh, Chemical Brothers at the time, but they definitely, definitely set up several. Um, uh, let's see, let's see, several anthems at the time, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, in a way, I would kind of, I kind of, uh, with, with the Crystal Method, I, I kind of, uh, because of their, their style, their, their style was a little bit less aggressive yeah. than the Prodigy, less driving and more chill. But, yeah. but but still moving forward, it wasn't so chill that it wasn't moving anywhere. Um, I would almost kind of say they were more trip hop break beat, yeah, you know, or you know with, with with some big beat elements uh, that that are very important to the sound of the Crystal Method. But you know, you know, I, I just mentioned two styles right there that that are also very important to electronic music. That's trip hop and break beat. You know, uh, those are two other styles of electronic music that don't really. Uh, you know, there's not too many main acts that are diving into that, to that, uh, to, to those sound, you know, uh, libraries or that style of, of creating electronic music. It's, it's really quite a shame. Like, you know, the, call me a little bit strange, but I do think that electronic music 
has that above any other genre of music. Electronic music, its its subgenres within it are much more prone to evolve and grow over time a lot quicker than other styles because it doesn't inherently depend on your ability as a musician as far yeah. as live performance. Now, it, it, it does have a lot to do more with your ability of sound design and your ability of song arrangement, you know, more so than, especially in today's age with all the computer technology that we have now. So, you know, I feel that there's not a, you know, not too many, I can't think, at least right now, I can't think of a single subgenre of electronic music that needs to die. It just needs to grow. If there's one that's outdated, let it grow. Let it become, you know, uh, a modern version of it. You know, a, a good example of this, drum and bass. Mm -hmm. Drum and bass uh, is a very, very different beast today than what it was. Uh, now it's a lot more aggressive. Um, but, but back in its inception, with people like Goldie, you know, uh, this was a a very a very uh, ambient, without you know, n not complete ambience, but it was like a an atmosphere experience. It was you were traveling with that music, and you know the what we have now as drum and bass is a lot more aggressive. It's a lot more gritty. You know, it almost yeah. uh, sounds slightly industrial now. So. Yeah. Uh, you know all these styles, and then, then you get drum step on top of it, which is basically just a a sort of like a, a cross between drum and bass and dubstep. So um, you, you know, another thing you mention it. There is this, uh, you know, I, I believe maybe that's the reason why why vapor wave is so popular right now. Like, yes, yes. If people are getting more into it, not only because of the memes, but also because of of uh, of the feeling that you get, you know the, the trippy feeling and and you know the, the melodic emotion that you can get out yeah. of one of uh, one of those songs. Now, yeah, <clears throat> it, it it depends also because there's vaporwave is totally experimental and it actually yeah actually gains a lot from that experimentation and that uh, kind of like tonality of uh, of the arrangement you know but <clears throat> yeah yeah but I believe that that's why we're kind of heading in this way where we had you know the peaks of more aggressive you know music in this in terms of drama bass let's say of dubstep or electro house and then you yeah. know stuff is going a little bit more mellow it's kind of like when Kaigo appeared right after after you know the whole electro house and electro house and progressive house scene, you know, which is pretty much you know jump, jump up and up and down all day, and then yeah. Kaigo appears, which is more mellow, more you know relaxed, more chilled, you know. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, it's it's the same as the yin and the yang. It's just two sides of the same coin. So, when it comes to drum and bass right now. I honestly would like that it went once again to the point where where it was with Goldie, you know, uh, back when yeah. when drum and bass was definitely just uh, straight up uh, electronic music from from a yeah. from a garage or uh, or a warehouse in the UK, you know. Yeah, yeah. And well, well I, if anyone, I if done if, anyone, if any, yeah. If anyone that knows more, uh, you know, drum drum bass, more chill drum bass artists, you know, we're always open to get yeah. comments oh, and oh, yes. to check out more oh, music yes. we can review, we can talk about oh, yes. it, you know, definitely. Yeah, yeah. For everyone that's a that, that listens to this this podcast, this show, please, 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 please feel free to yeah. uh, send us music from uh, different artists you know of. If you're an artist yourself, please contact us. We do care. You know, if you're an electronic music artist and you're serious about it, you know what I mean, and you want you want us to hear your track, we'll listen to it. You know, we will do our best to listen to it. And and, and you know, if you're trying to put yourself out there, you know, contact us. Yeah. We, we, we're, we're, we want to eventually even get to a point where we're interviewing um, some of you. So, but I, I was actually going to add to what Carl was saying, and I think. I think part of the reason that we're seeing uh, 
like for example with the drum and bass situation a uh, couple things one when dubstep hit in america not the uk the uk dubstep was very very different for those of you who may not know that mm -hmm. uh but when dubstep hit america and skrillex really put that that specific fm sound on the map and everybody wanted to have that talking bass when he did that that i feel is the the uh the shredding solo of electronic music you know when uh when speed metal kind of became a thing in the 80s and yeah. souls got faster everybody got obsessed with those fast solos and i feel like that's kind of what happened with the dubstep growling bass the dubstep growling bass is the shredding solo from the 80s i'm not saying that it's bad the, the, the talking the talking bass is awesome and has its place but i feel that that has become the main focus and so i think developers who create a lot of these new scents they're thinking in terms of that they're not thinking in terms of uh the same tools that people like goldie would have had back then and i think also it, it goes with the fact that you know if you take a synthesizer like uh let's see i'll go with something like uh, alchemy by camel audio which is no longer available which really saddens me but it's an amazing synth and if any of you were were, were lucky enough to buy it before they went out of business do your best to keep that install file um, that's an amazing wavetable uh, wavetable synthesizer, and it, I I bought it mainly for its sound design capabilities. It has a uh, a sound granulizer in it for granular synthesis, so it it's a really really powerful tool. But if you take that extremely crazy powerful tool and you try to recreate analog sounds with it, it it's like the most dull experience because that's not really what it's for. Uh, if you take Serum and you try to do very analog stuff with Serum, it's 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 going to be, you know, you can do it, but it it's just not really going to feel natural. It's not going to really mesh like that. Now, if you're doing a lot of crazy, talky rhythm basses, oh, yeah, Serum is especially for that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, the tools have changed and the way that they operate has changed. And so... It, it you know a lot of these tools they encourage a certain type of sound design they, they and they naturally because of that discourage others and so i think with the rising of modular synthesis i think the only reason why we don't see more modular synthesis is because it's so expensive to really get into but i think if we see more modular synth users rising and creating not just creating for themselves but actually putting out something for the public I think we're going to see a return in, in those those uh, those other styles, because those tools are meant for those type of sounds, and not so much about the the software synth. Which, you know, I think electronic music, if it does get a, a, a decent second wind, I think it's going to go back to analog really hard, for a certain amount of time. You know. Yeah, I I agree and disagree on that part. Because, um, well, the problem, at least on what, how, how, how accessible it is by now to make electronic music, um, probably we, we will get analog sounding synths, like soft synths. Yeah, like Alturia. Yeah, like, like the Alturia packs, but we're not gonna, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be easy to get, you know, the actual sense, you know, because, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the first stopper is the, is the amount of money that you, you will need to spend on a full modular system or a, or a mold yeah. or a profit five or something like that. But at the same time is that, um, well, we are already experiencing that because um, many, Many of the independent electronic music artists, or the or the indie scene, the indie rock scene, is incorporating really like analog vintage sounds in, in yeah. their music. So yeah. we're definitely going back to that, and it's pretty much like we're back in, in the '80s when it comes to when it comes to analog yeah. uh, analog synthesis. That's very true. That's you very know, true. And with music with music that actually you know that isn't that popular, but it's definitely out there. You know. The artists are going back to the 80s to kind of recapture that vibe. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. Just as we went back to the 70s when, uh, when electronic music was more like disco house, you know? Yeah, exactly. And exactly. Uh, it, it, it's kind of, yeah, it's cyclical in the end. And right now, we're gonna we're gonna continue going back to to more analog sounds, more organic sounds. I, I believe that, yeah. the, that the core of it will be organic sounds, but at the same time, something that will change is definitely the way people master their tracks. You know. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. in in my opinion, we're gonna go back to a time over to a point where where music is gonna be. Uh, a little bit more rough around the edges, and the mastering is yeah. not going to be that clean yeah. once again. Yeah. And that definitely can be <clears throat> can be a, 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 the, uh, a proof of it is is a resurgence of vinyl. You know, why yeah. why vinyl yeah. is is having uh, you know a, a, a rise nowadays. Exactly. You know, and vinyl isn't the cleanest form. You know of uh, of music sound, but it definitely sounds a lot warmer. It definitely sounds a lot nat more natural instead of digital yeah. sound. You yeah. know, so yeah. in terms of with resurgence of vinyl, <clears throat> we we have discovered this uh, site that pretty yes, much this is exciting. Cuts, cuts the middleman, which is the label. You know. Before you can get your hands on your on on your on your album pressed on vinyl, you know, and can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, there's this website, yeah, that we both just discovered called Diggers Factory. Yeah. And what and from what we have researched, what this website allows you to do that this is also this is just very 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 exciting they allow you to basically order your own vinyl for your own releases and that you know b before we we had places like this like diggers factory getting vinyl was uh kind of like getting a celebrity to give you an autograph it was a chore because the label had to agree to it the label had to you know, put the money out to get it. You know, it, it, it was there was a middleman, and now that middleman is gone. So, this website, Diggers Factory. I mean, if you're an artist and you have the money to dish out to have it printed, you've got yourself vinyl. <laughs> you got yourself full on. Like, I mean, that that to me is extremely exciting. And this is more of a, a nerd thing for me, but I also like the feeling of vinyl in my hands. It has this, it, it feels so much more satisfying. I don't know um, how everyone else feels, but I know when when I was a kid, uh, my mom had a, uh, a record player and we had tons and tons and tons and tons of vinyl. I think we had more vinyl than anything else. I mean, we had tape cassettes you know um but vinyl was what we had in the house we had crates of this stuff and when you pick up that huge like you know you've got this big case with this art on it and it was so satisfying to hold and to, to take this big thick piece of vinyl out of the case and stick it on turn it on and listen to it and 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 i and this is also going to be good for people who do albums and projects you yeah. know because because now because the one thing about uh <clears throat> vinyl is vinyl is a sit back pay attention process it's yeah. not your it's not your shuffle mp3 don't get me wrong the mp3 has definitely had its place and always will in today's world. But for the art form, you know, the MP3 was more of convenience. You know, uh, if you think about, think about it this way, when CDs came out, that was the beginning of the single culture because uh, now you have the ability to just press one button. You don't have to search for the song. You don't have to, 
you know, you, you, you don't have to worry as much about destroying your disc because you rewind it as you do with vinyl. With vinyl, if you scratch it enough, you're going to start noticing a difference in that part of the song that you keep scratching. And that kind of eliminated the, I'm going to just keep listening to this song only culture. And it kind of made people listen to things as a whole. And yeah. as an artist, that's exciting to me. Because, yes, there might be one song you really enjoy, but I would really enjoy it myself if you listen to this whole project. There's a whole world that I'm trying to speak about in this project, however songs that is. If, that's, if it's a small EP of three songs, it's a small EP of three songs. If it's a full-on 12-track 12, you know, 12 project, you know, those 12 tracks, they are, nothing is wasted to me you know, as an artist. I want every song to get its, its time to, to say something. And so that's also very, very exciting for me. And, and, and not just for listeners, but even for myself. I'm much more prone to put a piece of vinyl on and sit back and just enjoy the process. You know, Now the difference is with vinyl is vinyl is not something that I've ever uh, listened to while I'm trying to do other things. You know, that, that's what the MP3 player is kind of for. My phone is, is for that. But when I want to sit down and just drift off somewhere, that would be when I would use vinyl. And to me, that's probably the best time to appreciate the art form anyway. I mean, if you're doing dishes or cleaning your house, you got your MP3 on, you're not going to try to listen to something that's artistically challenging. You're, you're going to listen to the, to the, you're, you're going to listen to the, uh, to the uh, the song you can turn up and sing along with. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. All of these all of these different art forms have their place. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm more excited because I feel that the more adventurous, experimental, and uh, courageous side of experimentation in electronic music is going to have a, more of a voice now. Yeah. More of more of a lane of itself, where hey more people are going to probably give this a chance. And and Digger's Factory, that's what Digger's Factory means to me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, along those lines, like MP3s and CDs are a media that can be consumed, but uh, isn't, uh, isn't built for the long run. No, it's you not. Know? Vinyl lasts forever. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And the, the thing with it is that uh, MP3s or CDs are pretty much built for 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 the music to to be with you, you know, to yeah. just uh, uh, well, if you do something else, you're listening to the music. And that's that's what uh, that's what. That's what I would say is the main core of, uh, of CDs and MP3s. Now, yeah. in terms of vinyl, I always thought that vinyl is uh, this medium that can be enjoyed as if you would be drinking a bottle of your favorite wine. Yes. You know, yes. you just take some time for yourself. You can make yourself, you pour yourself a, a cup of wine or you make yourself a, a drink. Uh, you know, uh, one drink that you like, uh, you like, you take some time for yourself. Now, I, uh, I have watched uh, videos of uh, several other audiophiles that collect vinyl, and it's pretty much their appreci appreciation when it comes to when it comes to vinyl. It's actually you take time off for yourself, you know, and yeah, in the end, uh, you you end up listening to a whole album. You don't only listen to a couple of songs. <clears throat> you could, but um, it's not the same thing, you know, as selecting the songs. If you really like a song, then um, yeah, you can stand up and select the groove, but it's not going to be exact, the exact song. So the, the medium actually forces you to listen to a whole track, and at the same time, you have uh, the artist that needs to build a concept around the whole album. Not only just put the the most well known song as a first song on the, on the record, so the so the record sells, you know. Um, exactly. Exactly. And that that phenomenon was very common around uh, to, in the two thousands when when CDs came, because many many people just uh, many many guys were were interested on the singles because the singles were the ones that had uh, music video made for them. 
you know, so uh, the label usually told you what, you know what, uh, what you need to do is uh, put the, the singles as the first two tracks of the song, of the, of the, of the album, sorry, and then the people are going to buy your album. But then the artist says, but what, what about my other songs? Are they, I don't know if they're going to be listened to. Because, uh, right, right. you know, you have two songs which are the, the killer songs and the, the rest is just filler. And that's pretty much not the idea because the, the artists work, their, work his or her ass off to make that, to make that record, you know. And right, then right. We, we can get into a whole thing if the artist was, you know, frustrated and he just wanted to, you know, fulfill his contract with the label by making a full album, or he or he wanted, to, or he wanted to build, you know, a concept around the the production of that album. For example, right, right. I know, I know that it's not electronic music, but when uh, the American Idiot album came came uh, out from you know by Green Day, the whole right. thing was uh, was a rock opera, pretty much. The whole thing is uh, is built around like a concept album. You know, right, right. But other like pop punk bands of, at the time, they decided. You know what? Let's. I'm gonna put this song first. You know, because I know it's gonna sound. And the rest of the songs, well, tough luck. We we'll see if they get yep. on the, on the next single, or we can actually have one single the first song and a, another single that's the song in the middle, but the rest is just gonna fall flat. You know? <clears throat> yep, yep. So, with this, with uh, with Digger's Factory, the artist, if, it's up to him. If he wants to make, to press vinyl on it, he will need to make a full album and, a, and give, give it a full concept so that uh, his, his or, or her uh, investment actually matters, actually becomes something else. And if there are no labels to deal with, then cool. We, we can have a total resurgence of vinyl. I would love to have, you know, music that I made myself released on vinyl. Yeah. Um, at least that is there. And, and on, the, on the last part is, since vinyl pretty much lasts forever, you know, because of Absolutely. the material, of the material, we actually have have a medium that can be used to archive music that was special for us. And <clears throat> I was I was writing an article regarding vinyl, and right. the thing is, in the end, all the music that we have right now, all those all the streaming services, is music that's that is located. And it's located and stored in somewhere in somebody else's computer. At least in, t in terms of you know server farms in some place at, at some place in, in Silicon Valley. But what happens when those people simply decide you know what we're gonna repurpose these servers? Or we're gonna move? They they could move the whole the whole you know the, that whole archive to to another server. Right. But. Um, what what if the if the company in charge of of those, of that music simply decides you know what we're just gonna pull the just the more the most popular twenty percent of the of these songs from this um, from this server to the other what right. protects what what protects that music from a corporate decision uh, now I'm not gonna judge corporations because corporations are there <laughs> you know. And it's a oh, uh, and it, and it's it's a free market, but what protects music from being totally deleted from from the internet by just one corporate decision? Yeah. In the end, yeah. those though that music that we cherish so much is not is not going to last forever, because um, yeah. well, technology eventually, you know. Uh, so technology will evolve, and and through that evolution, pieces of the or pieces of history, pieces of art get lost. 
you know, and in in this evolution, I'm totally sure that there are gonna be there's gonna be music that's gonna be lost. Oh, you know? without doubt, without doubt. You know, so if we still have a physical medium that lasts a long time, then we can preserve certain certain parts of that of that history. We can preserve music that we've listened when we were kids. We can preserve music that absolutely that we that, we, that marked our lives pretty much for that we listen in a very special time of, of our lives you know and uh, in the end pro is gonna last forever because well vinyl doesn't decompose that fast you know it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, what's my god it's a it's a climate crisis when, when it comes to vinyl when it comes to vinyl plastic that doesn't yeah. decompose but if it's used in the right way, which is archiving music, and we we definitely have a medium that will or that won't be won't be decomposed in the long run. Yeah. Uh, unless yeah, you, that you overplay, you know, the, the vinyl because each time that you play it, the the grooves uh, start deteriorating. You know, but right, right. Still. But yeah, I mean that that's the beauty of vinyl. I mean, yeah. uh, I think that um, I think vinyl is is probably no, well, not probably, but it is pretty much the most dependable medium that we have. Uh, those of us in music, uh, as far as storing and keeping records, and uh, and I think it's all. It just so happens to also be one of the best ways to experience it as well. But uh, we want you guys to uh, please, please, please feel free to leave comments. Let us know what you think of what we're trying to do. Give us some feedback, uh, any uh, topics you want us to talk about. We want to make this as uh, informative but uh, uh, fun at the same time. So we're still getting our bearings here. So uh, yeah. for, those of you, for those of you who check out our show, uh, our podcast, our whatever you want to call it, our uh, little internet radio show, whatever, you know, we want to thank anybody who does take the time out to listen. And uh, uh, we just really appreciate electronic music culture. We really, really love you guys. Um, From the listeners to the ravers to the DJs to the producers, the sound designers, to the the people. Yeah, to the performers, to the people who are making the tools for us. You know, oh my goodness, we really have to give a special shout out to all of you. People who actually build all this stuff that we need to make electronic music function. The software engineers, the hardware engineers, you guys, you know, without you guys, we're, we're shit out of luck. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, without you guys, we're stuck with Casios. No offense, <laughs> Casio. But, yeah. uh, I mean, we, we really, seriously, we wouldn't be able to do shit without you guys. And um, yeah, so yeah, big shout out to the electronic music scene. Definitely. Well, that's uh, pretty much uh, everything for our first episode of this podcast. Uh, I hope uh, I hope that we didn't ramble that much. But anyways, we definitely pretty much are in love with music and especially electronic music. So. Well, you can't expect us to ramble about it. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and definitely yeah, yeah. a huge shout out to everyone involved in the in the scene, everyone that has built the tools that make make that makes it easier for us to, to put out to put out the sounds that we have in our heads out there and make them reality. Definitely. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, if, if you ahead. disagree with anything that we that we, uh, that we have said in this in this episode, just feel free to comment. <clears throat> we'll definitely read and <clears throat> we'll pro, we'll definitely be available for for some debate. You know, absolutely, just, keep, keep it civil. <laughs> yeah, keep it oh, civil. Yeah. But um, and that's that's the core of it. We 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 talk about it. We have a conversation. We. We debate and we share the musical we love, and with that, we're keeping 
keeping the music that we love with more life than what it's being done right now you know yeah. and that's there's nothing no, nothing nothing else I can say about it just share comment uh, give give us a shout out send the music that you want us to listen and review next and just comment what was your first your first record here the first electronic record and we'll definitely definitely check it out so anyways all right thank you guys and we'll see you definitely we'll see you guys. hi we'll see you guys on the next episode all right